I can just go up and down right here, right? Well, I have to tell you, I just drove down from, from Great Falls. Montana is beautiful. I've never been here before. And if you don't take the opportunity every time you walk out those doors to soak it in, then there is something wrong with you. Or you're awfully spoiled. It is second only in beauty to Alabama. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I gave, I gave a variation on this talk last night to the Montana Weed Society. Um, is I'm going to give you something very similar, but I'm going to approach it from a totally different angle. I'm going to talk about this in terms of an invasive species and controlling invasive species. Uh, you, you deal with invasive species here in Montana, just different ones than we deal with in Alabama, but you commonly have the same approach. You know, how do you deal with them? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through kind of a case study with wild pigs, talk about their history in the United States, why they are a problem, where they are a problem, the things that we've done to try and control them, and what we've learned about controlling them that has been wrong, and the, and the mistakes that we've made, and how we can move forward. Um, to correct something that was just stated in my introduction, you have had wild pigs in Montana before. Most people aren't aware of it. They jumped on it real quick, took care of it. Um, there's been 13 states, and I can't remember them all, but Alaska, Montana, a um, host of other ones. I know it was Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota was in that list that have had them at one time that does not have them today. There are only three states in the United States that, doesn't, that have never had wild pigs, and that's Wyoming, Rhode Island, and it was, was it Connecticut? can't remember the third one. I had it written down yesterday and I don't have my cheat sheet with me. I apologize. Um, let's talk about wild pigs in terms of being an invasive species. It's not working. So this won't do it. There we go. I got it. A um, little bit of a definition. What are wild pigs? Uh, you've heard the term feral hogs or feral pigs or wild pigs or wild boar. Well, feral hogs or feral pigs are, or, are escaped or released domestic pigs. They are direct descendants of domestic stock that have become wild again. Something most people don't realize, you're used to looking at domestic pigs. They're, they're pink, not much hair, curly tail, uh, that sort of thing. Doesn't look like anything like the pictures I'm going to show you. But this is a really unique critter. In two generations, they begin to take on the physical characteristics of domestic stock. They start to become more hairy, get, get more of a razorback appearance, small hips. The young begin to be born striped, just like um, Eurasian wild boar, but they start to take on that Eurasian wild boar appearance within two generations of being released from, from domestic situation. Wild boar, these are purebred Eurasian wild boar. Um, this strain has been introduced in North America for hunting purposes, normally introduced inside of a high fence understand when, or some sort of fenced enclosure, but understand there's no such thing as a pig-proof fence. It might be pig-proof today, it might be pig-proof tomorrow, but I promise you at some point after tomorrow, it will not be pig-proof anymore. Um, understand that this is, this is Sioux Scrofa, the same as domestic pigs are Sioux Scrofa. The difference is domestic pigs were selectively bred from Eurasian wild boar at some time historically, past in the past 5, 10, 15,000 years, for food purposes. So we're, we're talking about a selectively bred individual when we're talking about feral hawks or domestic pigs. We also have hybrids here, hybrids of the two. Because we can't tell what's what, we have Eurasian wild boar all mixed in with these, with our um, feral hogs, and essentially we have hybrids today with a strong predominance of domestic pig in them, but some Eurasian wild boar. As a result, what we do today is we, the correct terminology, they're wild pigs. It covers all of these sorts of scenarios. A little bit of the history. The original introductions in North America was the 1500s. There were no pigs in North or South America prior to the 1500s. And what used to happen is the early original, the earliest documented release was Hernando de Soto um, down in the Florida region. And early, early explorers would release domestic pigs when they'd come across on a ship, release them on shore, release them on islands because they did so well naturally, when they came back through and they would stop at these same places, they had a ready source of food that they were familiar with. So they've been here since about the 1500s. Traditionally, they've, been, they've spread very slowly by natural means. If you consider that these animals have been here almost 500 years, 
And if I sh when I show you the map, which is coming up here in a few slides, of where they are today in North America, you'll say, wow, they really haven't moved that far. And it goes against any, everything that I was taught um, that, are, you know, prior to the previous 10 years, we were told, yeah, they move readily across the landscape, they show low site fidelity and that sort of thing. But re in reality, they move across the landscape extremely slowly. What we've seen is in recent decades a dramatic expansion in where we find them. They move across the landscape slowly, but they're moving across North America very quickly. We're putting them on wheels. We're putting them in the back of trucks, and we're releasing them in new places. That's what we have going on today. So we have, we have a dilemma here. We have a crisis that is rapidly becoming more and more important. Here in Montana, you're not aware of it. I'm going to try and illustrate for you during the next 45 minutes or so why you should be. This is, um, this image is, this is 1982, the map, um, and the green and red indicate where wild pigs were generally found. Notice um, Hawaii down in the bottom left. Hawaii is covered up. Island state. A lot of pigs dropped off there by early explorers. California had a lot. Texas has traditionally been covered up, so has Florida. If you notice the southeast, there's a lot of areas in the southeast that have wild pigs. Um, southeastern Tennessee, Great Smoky Mountains National Park has always been, has been covered up with them for a long time. But really, it doesn't look too bad there. 30 states prior to 2000 had wild pigs. Today, they have been in 47 at this point that we know of. There's three that we're pretty sure we have not had wild pig um, breakout. So that original map is 1982, this is 1988. Notice that there's not much difference, maybe a little bit more. This is 2004, this is the most recent that I can find. Take a look at California. Take a look at Texas. Take a look at how much green is there in the southeast. I'll zoom in on the south, here's, here's all, this is that same picture for all of North America, um, or all the United States. Take a look at Missouri. Take a look at Kansas. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, and this is the southeast. You can start to see little green dots everywhere. We've got a case of the chicken pox. They're starting to pop up in little individual locations. Even these pigs don't have wings. We're driving them from spot to spot. This is what we have going on. The interesting story is why this happened. That's what's really interesting. You know, there's some of you that are my age that are probably hunters or outdoors, out sportsmen, hunting, fishing, whatever it is. You know, if you're my age or a little bit older, then back in the 70s, early 80s, there was one hunting and fishing show on TV, American Sportsman. I still, yeah, I still get goosebumps when I hear Kurt Gowdy's voice, because that was the only thing you could catch. It was on once a week, and if, it was, if you were lucky enough to, to catch it. There were two hunting and fishing magazines, Outdoor Life, in field and stream. It's a little bit different today. There's, a, there's this increased popularity in hunting and fishing and wanting to go do what everybody else is doing. Um, today, you have four, five, six outdoor channels that have 24-hour hunting and fishing on TV. You get to see white-tailed deer hunting here and feral pig hunting here and all of these different things, and you say, wow, I want to do that. You go into Books A Million or a bookstore, and you go back to the magazine rack, in the antler pornography section, and there's going to be two, three, four magazines just on wild boar hunting. The popular media has made this a big deal, and people say, I want to do that. The last 10 to 15 years, we've been putting lots of pigs on wheels and releasing them in new areas. Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New York, hasn't been as big a deal out west yet, other than along the coast. But it is coming. Driving across today from Great Falls, I was looking at that, we was talking about it with Joe, and I was just like, I could see these guys doing okay here. They would do okay. But that's what you have. It's a popularity thing. It says, I want those. I want them on this property, and all you got to do is turn them loose, and they will be fine. So why are they such a problem? Um, a lot of their food they get from below the soil surface. And anybody that's spent time around domestic pigs knows that they have the ability to push a lot of dirt. Uh, the, 
in Europe, they use them to find truffles. They can smell truffles three feet below the soil surface and actually get down to them. We, have, we find the same thing when they go after some fancy fungi in the southeast. But they move a lot of soil to eat invertebrates, roots, tubers, things like that below the soil surface. And that picture up there in the upper right, all of that brown, that is, that is in a riparian wetland on Fort Benning in um, west central Georgia. You can see the green in the background. That's what it normally looks like on the ground. All of that brown is disturbed by pigs. You start looking a little closer at what happens. Take a look at the, the root mass, of the roots of the trees from all of the soil that's overturned. There's going to be damage to all of that vegetation. You're going to have increased sedimentation in those streams, erosion, things like that. It's a major, major problem what they're doing with that, and we, don't, we have not yet begun to understand what that really means, you know, how it really impacts the ecosystem. But some of the environmental problems, we have issues, there's issues with sedimentation. When you're turning over the dirt, when you're taking off the vegetation, any sort of rain or any sort of water movement, you're going to have problems with sedimentation in streams, you're going to have, and that which is being caused by erosion. Um, they're going to alter plant composition. That has already been documented that, the, that they negatively impact native plant communities, and in their rooting, they, will, they can increase the prevalence of invasive species. They alter nutrient cycling. We have not looked at this yet in North America, but we know in Europe, when you remove them from an area where they're native, nutrient cycling totally changes. So it makes sense if you introduce them here, they're going to change nutrient cycling. What does that mean for plant and animal communities and aquatic communities? We don't know. We haven't looked at it yet. Um, they're going to decrease water quality. Fecal coliform, um, all sorts of other different bacteria and that sort of thing, they're going to impact the water quality. So they're, they're impacting the ecosystem in multiple ways. From a management perspective, in the southeast, food plots for hunting are a big deal. Um, we have problems with, with them on food plots. Damage to crops, uh, damages to pastures, um, damages to qu equipment. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but what happens is when you start getting holes that are three feet across and two feet deep, and you don't see them when you're driving across the pasture, you start snapping axles. On Fort Benning, where we did a lot of our research, one of the favorite places for these pigs to go out, on, out onto is this huge field where their paratroopers would land. Broken legs broken ankles, things like that. Wildlife problems. In the southeast, ground nesting birds are a big issue. Quail, turkeys, up here, you know, it would, it would be pheasants, grouse, things like that. Um, white-tailed deer. We find that they exclude white-tailed deer from areas. Very low use by white-tailed deer of areas where pigs spend a lot of time. We also find active predation of fawns. During one of our studies, we heard the squealing in the woods. We were, we were using a thermal camera to try and locate pigs to shoot for a food study, food habit study, and we heard this, squeal, this, this animal squealing up in the woods. We shine the thermal camera back there and look, and we see the pig, shoot the pig. Well, that, that boar was eating that fawn alive. When we actually did the, food, did the food habits, what we did is we found a pig stomach full of fawn intestines. This is a biology class. I can talk about those things, isn't it? <laughs> squirrels. People say squirrels. Why are squirrels a big deal? I think they, my, I speculate that they probably have a greater impact on squirrels than any other wildlife species in North America. And that's just me guessing. Because in, the acorns disappear from the ground in November, big mast crop, December. Yet we can go out there and we can shoot pigs. There's no acorns left, and they will have stomachs full of acorns. And what they're doing is they're, they're, going up, they're going around and they're finding squirrel caches. I think they are probably having a huge impact on squirrels, box squirrels and gray squirrels. Sea turtle nests, amphibians and reptiles. The list goes on and on. We, just, we, haven't, we haven't done studies to figure out what those impacts are. Agriculture, right now. The last published estimate that we've seen is $1.5 billion in damage to agriculture each year. We believe that that number is conservative. I can promise you that it will be conservative 10 years from now because they're just popping up in Iowa, in Illinois, in Ohio, in Indiana, in these areas that agriculture is huge. Agriculture is everything there. 
and they are when when they when they get going, they're going to explode, and we're going to see massive amounts of damage. So when they get into these new areas, those estimates are going to increase. Row crops specifically, corn. There's a picture with corn. Um, soybeans in the southeast, peanuts in the southeast, cotton they cause problems with. You name it, and they cause damage with any sorts of row crops. Pastures. Uh, I'd already mentioned pastures. They're going after in, they're going after insects and invertebrates underneath the, the soil surface. Um, they're going to cause damage out there. This is not bad in this picture, um, but this is this is common what this looks like, you know. But they're just going in a couple inches. You can find holes. Uh, I'm not exaggerating that are two feet deep. And will look it will look like a moonscape, an area the size of this room, with holes within holes. It's amazing how much earth they'll move. Domestic swine, there's issues with domestic swine. There's issues with livestock, both sheep and cattle. Let's talk about domestic swine a second. Domestic swine has the potential to be catastrophic, the impact that they could cause uh, because of swine brucellosis and pseudorabies and a couple of other um, swine diseases. Well, if you, when you pic picture domestic swine, operation. It is generally full of females, all in different stages of reproduction. That is a muddy, mighty attractive sight. The individual boars that are wandering through the woods and what you have is any sort of disease that can be transferred by nose-to-nose -nose contact can be transferred into this domestic swine facility. And we have worked very, very hard over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years to rid ourselves of brucellosis and pseudorabies in our domestic swine herds. When that happens, the price of pork is going to plummet, and our domestic pork industry, in whatever state that occurs in, is going to crash. This whole $1.5 billion thing now becomes something else. If it happened in Iowa, where there's a big pork industry, they could recover. I've already been told by our pork people in Alabama Pork is not a big thing in Alabama, it's just kind of barely hanging on. If it ever happened, it would never recover. They'd be done, probably forever. So there's huge potential to transmit to domestic swine. How do they deal with it? They have to double fence. They cannot allow anything to get right to the fence. Sheep and cattle, we've got issues with diseases also. Swine brucellosis, bovine tuberculosis, hoof and mouth disease or any other disease that could potentially, potentially be used by, from a bioterroristic perspective. We can't control wild pigs right now. How would we ever control a disease that was introduced by some terrorist organization into wild pigs? And you might say, eh, it's pretty far-fetched. Um, we know that Saddam Hussein in Iraq was looking at a lot of these diseases. There's, there, it's, it's been documented a lot of these sorts of diseases they were looking at and exploring options. Would this be good? Would that be good? You know, I'll go back to September 11th, was it 2001? Um, it, it was a horrific day. If they had introduced hoof and mouth disease to wild pigs, it would not have been a horrific day. But we would still be feeling the effects of this today and for the next 20, 30, 40 years, and the costs would have been far greater. There would have been less lo human life lost, but the, the impacts would have been far, much more far-reaching. Predation. They are the second greatest predator of livestock in some parts of Texas. When you think about predators, you, up here you think about wolves, think about bears, think about lions, you might think about coyotes. Second greatest predator of livestock in some parts of Texas. Nobody knows it because they don't leave anything remaining. It's usually newborns that they're consuming, and they consume the entire carcass. By the time morning comes, there's nothing there. Rancher never even knew it happened. And this is a picture of a pig with a sheep carcass. They are omnivorous. Here's why they pose such a problem. I just described to you what they did. I've told you where they came from. This is what makes wild pigs special, makes them extremely unique from a control perspective. They have a litter size of four to eight. They have two litters in a year. 
they can have up to three litters in 14 months if they're in good condition. And they can be sexually mature normally around six to eight months. And we've been finding pigs that are sexually mature at four and a half to five months. We put this in another context. If you take a mule deer or an elk, on that deer or elk's, that female deer or elk's second birthday, they are going to have their first fawn or first calf. Let's just talk about mule deer, keep it simple. That, that mule deer doe on her second birthday, on or about, is going to have her first offspring, and she will likely have one. These pigs, by the time a female pig reaches her second birthday, will probably have somewhere between 12 and 18 offspring. This is the most reproductively prolific large mammal on earth that is walking around wild. Because understand, this animal has been selectively bred to maximize reproduction. I did some work in 2012, 2013 over in Morocco on their wild boar. They reproduce once a year. Ours reproduce twice. It's arid over there. They have very low survival of their juveniles. We have very high survival. We've got a major problem here. We have something that reproduces faster than we can control it. This is, as I said last night at the Montana Weed Control Association, their banquet. This is a weed on four legs. A couple of examples of population growth. There's a population in Australia. It is reduced by 70%. In two years, back to normal. That's all it took. Walk away from it for two years, back to normal. Population in Oklahoma, McAllister Army Ammunition Plant. They had zero pigs in 1995. By the year 2000, they were moving 100 to 200 per year. And they began removing them the month that they first found them in 1996. It took five years. They've got 100 to 200 that they're removing. And these are people that knew what they're doing. These, are the, these, were some, these were some Oklahoma rednecks that can gather it up if it swims, slithers, hops, flies, crawls, whatever it is. Trust me. And they worked hard at it, and they could not get this under control. It is scary how fast they go. This is my glory shot. This is how we control pigs today. And now this is where I want you to start thinking about what I said at the start, about how would you do this? If you had pigs pop up here in, in Montana on your property or somebody's property, you're put in charge, how, how would you do this? Shoot them. Yeah. You know, deer hunters. This, is, this was me deer hunting one day in South Carolina. I killed three pigs. Not a very good deer hunter, but I guess I can kill pigs. Um, opportunistic shooting. That's a control option. We can bait them up and we can shoot them. This is a picture from Texas. Boy, one bullet, you can get two or three. Take out the right gun, you can get you can get some shots off pretty quick. You can get you can, you can gather them up. The Judas pig technique. This one's being proposed by Wildlife Services. Judas pig technique. You put a radio collar on a pig. You can follow it to the other pigs. Very creative. Dog hunting. This has become very popular. Very very popular. See, their dogs have radio collars on them, so they can find them. Uh, some of the serious dog hunters that like their dogs, they put Kevlar vests on their dogs. They'll have track trailing dogs and catch dogs, They'll normally like a bulldog or, some, or, or a Rottweiler or a pit bull. Pit bulls are real common. But they turn loose at the, at the last second, it'll go in, they'll hold those pigs. And then they come in and stab the pig. They don't shoot them. They have a long knife. They get right in there real clo close and personal and stab them through the heart. That's pig hunting with dogs in the southeast. These are all proposed as good techniques. I'm going to tell you right now, all four of these are failures at controlling wild pigs. We've been doing this for 500 years. We, didn't, we haven't been doing the radio collar stuff. But we've been doing this stuff for 500 years, and we haven't been able to control it. We try this. Shooting, hunting, Judas pigs, dog hunting does not work. You cannot kill them fast enough. As much as, who's a hunter in here? Every, you like going out there and you're like, I, I, I think I could do it, man. I could handle going out and doing this every day for a couple weeks. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot keep up with them. You can't do it. Because as, as much of an outdoorsman or outdoorswoman as you think you are, 
you've got nothing on an Alabama redneck. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Trapping has the potential. Trapping right now is the one control technique that we have available to us that in theory can control wild pigs. But if it's going to be effective, you have to be strategic with how you do it. And I'm going to talk about how we do this now. I want to change your mind about how you might do it because I know you sat there and you're like, yeah, I heard saw some people nodding. Yeah, you could shoot them. You shoot every one. You do this, you do that. You do all these things. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. Common sense does not apply here until I tell you the whole story and then you're going to say, I see where I made the mistake. We started wild pig research in Fort Benning, Georgia, and this is um, here in East Central Georgia, actually goes it, or West Central Georgia, it's actually East Central Alabama also. Uh, it's a picture of Fort Benning there on the right, kind of surrounds Columbus. Columbus is, I don't know, it's like 200,000 people. So it's a fairly populated area. Fort Benning is a large area. I can't remember how many acres it is total, uh, but it's a very large military training area. Oh, 180,000 acres. Um, infantry mechanized. It's the home of the Army Rangers. Um, really interesting place to work. They've had wild pigs for over 100 years. Uh, they cause problems with endangered species, gopher tortoises, uh, multiple species, relic trillium. So they have major concerns over their impact on endangered species. You know every, every environmental group's favorite people to sue is the military because the military likes to blow stuff up. They cause, impact, cause problems with endangered species. When we worked there, and we started our first original research right at the end of 2003, 2000, start of 2004, um, the density across the base is about eight, anywhere from probably, I put eight, but it could be five to maybe 15 pigs per square mile, depending upon where on base you are. Doesn't sound that like that many. Not that many animals. Our initial study, 03 to 07, uh, we took a look at food habits. What were they eating? That sort of thing. We wanted to look at reproduction. Um, so we, we examined reproductive tracts. We tried to understand if, pot, den, if densities were lower, did we see increases in reproduction or, or density-dependent response. Uh, we look at population response to control efforts. What happens? If we shoot as many as we can, how does that population respond? Um, we also looked at spatial dynamics. We tried to figure out where these animals go. How do they use the landscape? How much space do they use? Do they, use them, do they move at night? Do they move during the day? As much as pigs have been a problem for a long time, nobody had really looked at, at any of these questions very much. So we spent four to five years looking at this with the goal of trying to figure out a way to control them. From this, let me back up a second, this last thing, spatial dynamics, we found something that had been hinted at in the scientific literature. We confirmed it. Some work that came out of, out of Texas, Eric Helgren's work, um, came out of Texas. They said we, they thought they saw territoriality in their pigs. And let me describe to you social structure in pigs. Males move around the landscape independently. Females form groups called sounders. The sounders are groups of related females and young. Well, these sound, they said, we think these sounders are territorial. When I, and understand, when I say territorial, I mean they're, they're using exclusive space and they're not letting in any other animals. They're defending that space against other animals. So we saw that. And, we're, you know, and we sat back and said, this is interesting. Can we use the biology of this animal against them? And we, we, we had an epiphany. We came up with the theory of what, of what we call whole sounder removal. Now, if you take a look at this honeycomb here, and you imagine that each one of these individual areas is a, ter is a, a sounder and its territory. Remember, a sounder is a group of related females and young, and a sounder can be, can be anywhere from 4 to 25 individuals, and you might have small cells or large cells. What we theorized was we can go in and we can get the whole sounder. And our philosophy was, get them all. If we get all those females and they're young, then we have essentially created a hole 
or an area where there's no pigs. And on average, it was about, a sounder's territory is about 800 acres at Fort Benning. So we cleared eight. We would clear 800 acres in theory. So let's go in there and let's get these 10 or let's get these 17 and let's clear that territory and then let's move around it and all of a sudden, wow, we've got 5,600 acres clear. This is a theory of whole sound removal and go in again, 15,000 acres. We have just boiled this down to a simple strategy. Start, identify a group, go in there and start with that group. Simplify. We can trap pigs. You know, they're, 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 you know you've, you've heard the song, A Country Boy Can Survive. Well, that's written by a southern boy. They can gather them up. I don't care what it is. They know how to do this stuff. But the difference between this and what, and what they used to do is what they used to do is they used to try and maximize a body count. Kill as many as you can. Well, I'm going to argue it doesn't matter how many you kill. It only matters how many you leave behind. And there's a slight difference in that strategy. Well, well, let me show you what happened. Here's the theory, and, I, and, I, and I'll talk to you about that. Let me show you what happened. So we went out and we employed this. And remember, we got, we got four things that are real important here in our whole sound removal. Number one is pigs are territorial, which that's really the answer to your question. Why aren't they just moving in? Because they just, they just don't. They're just not going to new places, or at least we hoped they wouldn't at the time. They move across the landscape very slowly. They show high sight fidelity. If your neighbor moved out of their house, are you just going to move right in sort of thing? No, you're, you're comfortable where you are. If you need a little more space, yeah, you might throw some trash over there, something like that. But in general, you're going to stay on your property. Um, what, what we found through this whole sound removal is that when we did eradicate an area, because, or we theorized that if they move across the landscape very slowly, when you do clear an area of pigs or eradicate pigs in an area, it's going to be recolonized very slowly. That was what we theorized. And then there's this final rule that sound you're saying, you're sitting here saying, boy, that's just silly. That, that, that makes common sense. You don't need to tell me. But this is, this is really the basis of it. And this is what we were missing before. If you do eliminate all the pigs in an area, there's none left to reproduce. And that's what we were not doing. This is simple biology, getting back to the basics, understanding the territoriality to give us a strategy, but also coming back to basics that says we have to get them all. You know, as I said, I talked to the Montana Weed Control Association last night. And I said, you know, it's like weeds. If you're trying to clear past your weeds, you want to spray them all. You don't want to spray 50%. What good does that do? Because when you walk away, next week, next month, next year, you're going to be covered up again. If you can get them all, then you're good. Five-step process. We have the tools to be able to do this. A game camera. These are real common, um, at least with white-tailed deer hunters. Um, Five-step process, begin by surveying the population. Find some pig sign, put out some corn, put up a game camera, and see if you have pigs coming in. Once you have pigs coming in, identify the unique groups and the unique individuals in each group. You take a look at that picture up in the right, or this one in the bottom left, or the one in the bottom right. Each of these, if you look at it, you're like, yeah, I can see individual pigs. Well, if you, leave, if you keep baiting them for a week, or two, or three, and leave that camera up there, you can get a count on how many's in that group. You can also tell, well, I got seven juveniles and six adults. You can probably start nailing, you know, with the one up there on the right, you can nail them down to individual almost. I've got, a, I've got a brown one, I've got a black one, I've got two little red ones, and a little, little Oreo colored one. Identify unique individuals. Game cameras are easy. Put them out, walk away, come back. Construct your traps and habituate them. When we trap these things, we want to get them all. We set up a, we set up a, set up a trap with as large a door as possible. We put a camera on it, and we tie the door open. And we bait them and bait them and bait them and bait them. We continue to check our cameras once a week or twice a week to see when we're getting all the pigs coming in. I don't want to trap half the animals. Understand, this is the smartest animal on four legs on Earth, I believe. I honestly believe that. You have heard the story that pigs are smarter than dogs. 
I, I'm, I truly believe that. And I believe that they're smarter than some other things that are supposed, supposedly up the chain. I know they're smarter than some of the students we have at Auburn. Um, once you have them habituated, once you have them habituated, then you trap. Once you know that they're all going in, then you set the traps, and you set the traps to get them all. If you only get three out of ten, turn them loose. Everybody struggles with that a little bit. If you get nine out of ten, you might want to you might want to kill the nine. If you've got too many to get in one trap, build three traps, the same site. Get them all. It's worth the, it's worth that effort to clear 800 acres in one shot, in one night. And then the final thing is to monitor afterwards. And what this picture is is that's corn placed out on the ground. After we've trapped an area, we're going to set up a camera, and we're going to we're going to see did we miss any because there might have been a female that was out farrowing or something like that. We want to make sure that we didn't miss any because that one will be our undoing. And I'll give you an example here in a little bit of how that happened. Here's our study area at Fort Benning. This is northwest Fort Benning. This is the edge of Columbus. And this is 100 square kilometers. It's about, um, about 20,000 acres. These are our 15 sounders that we had identified. We've been working with these for a long time. Most of them we had ear tagged. A lot of them we had put GPS collars on. We knew the edges of the territories of the sounders. We wanted to understand what we were working with. We knew most of the individuals. We'd snap pictures of all of them. Well, we wanted to go in and see the question, what's going to stop them from coming in? So what we did is we went in and nailed two sounders in May of 2009. It took us 15 days. We cleared 28 pigs out of sounder one and seven pigs out of sounder two. We did it in two weeks. Not that big a deal. We cleared about 3,000 acres. And then we walked away. We wanted to see what was going to happen. We didn't clear any more pigs. We set up camera bait sites in territories one and two, and we had GPS radio collars on sounders 11, 12, 3, 4, 5, 6, all surrounding it to see what would happen. No pigs moved in. We, six months. We let it sit for six months. We had males walk through, but we don't worry about males. Males don't produce piglets. We only worry about females. So we sat there for six months. We went back out after another six months and nailed three more sounders. 21 pigs, 13 pigs, 7 pigs. At this point, we're looking at five to 6,000 acres that we have cleared. And we walked away for another six months. We did the same thing. Wanted to know what was going to happen. Well, after six more months, sound areas one and two were still pig-free. Three, four, and five were pig-free except for one small little area of one of these territories that they had come over and kind of taken over. We lost about 400 acres, I think it was, to, a, to an adjoining sounder. They decided they need a little more space. They took it over. We had a couple instances of some pigs go in and check out a feeder, stay for a day, go back home, never come back. We're pig-free for a year in one and two, pig-free for six months in three, four, and five. With our projects ro rolling to a close, we wanted to see what we could do, and we hit them all. And over the summer of 2010, we cleared 180 more pigs. Um, it, was, it was a Herculean effort. Uh, it's, it's a wonder. They didn't, we've got piles of pigs in the back of pickup trucks that are just unreal. Um, they were really gathering them up, going as fast as they could. It was, it was a lot to do. 20,000 acres we cleared. except for two. We know there was two. One of them had a, had a radio collar on it, and there was one with it, and we were done. We told the base, base personnel, they would contracted with us to, to learn how to do this. We said, you've got two, go get them. And they wouldn't listen to us. They did not make this a top priority. They never got them. A year and a half later, they had 70 in the middle of this area, surrounded by an area with no pigs. They left two. We left two. But we essentially cleared 20,000 acres. We would have gotten those two. I feel confident in that. This works. We used the biology of the animal, the territoriality concept to say, what if we did this? Same approach, trapped them, did the same exact thing everybody had done. We just applied it in a strategic approach. And there's some lessons to remember here. Wild pig control historically has been about maximizing a body count, but that approach doesn't work. To this day, in April, 
This coming April in Montgomery, Alabama, we will have our National Wild Pig Meeting. We have it every two years. On the first evening, we will have a social. Everybody will be get, getting together, seeing old buddies, that sort of thing, and they're going to be talking pigs. And as you can walk around this room, you can eavesdrop on groups as you go by. And I'll, this group will be saying, man, we killed 642 this year. And there will be another group that says, gosh, we, you know, we got 100 last year, 200 this year. And everybody's talking about how many pigs they killed. You know, it, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a man contest. You know, it's just who's the toughest. Not one person is going to say how many they left behind. We presented this information four years ago at a conference, and they still haven't figured it out. We can't convince them of it. There are some individuals doing it, but they still all get together and are still all going to talk about how many they killed. It doesn't matter how many you kill. It doesn't matter how many you remove. It only matters how many you, re you leave behind, especially with an animal that's, that's this reproductively prolific. And I would say the same thing for any invasive species. You can go out there and kill all you want, remove all you want, but unless you have a strategy that's proven, all you're doing is making yourself feel good and spending money. Morals of the story. <clears throat> Common sense is not a necessarily a good foundation for control of invasive species. Common sense says kill them and kill as many as you can. Don't just rely on common sense. Rely upon knowledge. You need sound biological information. If you don't have that sound biological information, you are setting yourself up for failure. And then I'll leave you with a little slide to show you what Montana could look like without application of sound biological knowledge. What sorts of questions can I answer for you? You're right, and we have it published, and I can't remember the number, to be honest with you. Um, I think we're looking at about three versus 